Welcome to this summary of the resource view based on Competing on Resources and featuring David Gallus, Cynthia Montgomery, Warren Buffett, and Michael Porter. Just kidding. Sorry, Michael. The resource-based view tells us that superior performance is a result of resources, either tangible or intangible, that create value. Oh, hey, Socrates. I agree. The definition does sound circular. If better resources simply lead to superior performance, how can there be space for a firm strategy? I'll explain how good strategy can help firms improve their resources and therefore improve performance. There are three key questions to ask when using the resource-based view. What resources does a firm have? What resources can a firm build? And what resources can a firm maintain? With the RBV, the focus is on the individual firm as opposed to the industry. There are five tests in Collis and Montgomery's framework. The first test is inimitability. It simply means unable to be imitated. One key idea is physical uniqueness. We could see this, for example, with the gold mine. The gold exists only in very rare veins of quartz that extend deep into the earth. A second idea is capability. Berkshire Hathaway has a distinct capability in buying companies and then effectively managing those acquisitions for long-term profits. The third concept is activity path complexity. As we saw in the video about Porter's article, What is Strategy?, Southwest structures their strategic activities such that they are reinforcing and difficult to copy. Their low prices come from fast plane turnarounds, which necessitate compromises like no meals and no seat assignments. The fourth concept in inimitability is brand name. Brand names are difficult to build. They require time and exposure through advertising and consumer product use. One of the strongest brand names out there is Coke. When I was a kid, I used to go to my grandparents' house. Wait, it wasn't anything like that. Let's try something more suburban. Yikes. Okay, something nicer. Even nicer. Uh, too nice, but this will have to do. And when I got to my grandparents, I could drink a Coke. And this was the only time as a kid that I could have a soda. So I've associated Coke with good moments for over 30 years. Needless to say, that kind of brand association is difficult to build. Oh, hey, Warren Buffett, what are you doing here? Oh, that's great, Warren. Anything else? I assume you bought because Coke has such strong consumer loyalty. Cool. Well, thanks, Warren. The second RBV test is durability. This asks how quickly the resource depreciates and how often it needs maintenance or updating. Obviously, longer-lasting resources are more valuable. Pharmaceuticals benefit from 20-year-long patents on new drugs, which grants them a temporary monopoly on their intellectual property. Resources also fade over time and need investment in order to be maintained. This explains why there are interminable updates to the iPhone in the form of new models. The third RBV test is appropriability. This asks who captures the value that a resource creates. Even though this is America and we have strong property rights, owners of resources do not always capture the profits generated by their resources. For example, even though Iowa soil is the best in the world for growing corn, farmers in Iowa who own their land see relatively little profit from their resources. Let's imagine that this ear of corn represents all of the potential revenues from corn. We'll see how potential profits are eaten away, if you will. Expenses take a large bite out of these revenues. Farmers need capital equipment like combine harvesters, and they spend money on consumable expenses like diesel fuel. Then farmers have to buy their corn seed. Monsanto and Dow DuPont make up the vast majority of the corn seed market. Because of this concentrated oligopoly, these two companies have far more supply chain power and hence far higher profits than the farmers. Mm. I should have known, Warren. Next, corn is quite heavy and it needs to be transported to market somehow. Warren, could you tell me why farmers use trains to transport their crops? Mm. That's right. Since there's only one train line going through any given farming region, farmers have to use them. This must be a great setup for the owners of the trains. W Warren, do you know who owns the train companies, uh, particularly Burlington Northern Santa Fe? They own about 20% of the railroad tracks in Iowa. Mm. Of course, Warren. After all of these expenses and market forces, is there any way for farmers in Iowa to make a profit? Mm. Well, thanks, Warren, you sly dog, you. On the other hand, appropriability can be quite high. Google controls virtually all of the value that comes from its resources. Their most valuable asset is the ad space at the top of their search results. Because Google is a near monopoly, advertisers pay full market price for their ads. 
Google has few, if any, limits on retaining these profits from competitors. Bing still represents a small fraction of search engine revenues, there are no regulatory limits, and Google faces little to no threat from their buyers and suppliers. The fourth RBV test is substitutability. This test asks if another product can be substituted to solve the same problem that your product solves. This is similar to Michael Porter's ideas on substitutability, though Collis and Montgomery use this idea in a more expansive way. But at a basic level, the parallel holds. As a substitute for butter, you could have, wow. I can't believe it's not butter, which is essentially congealed soybean oil dressed up to look like butter, which it's clearly not. No offense, Fabio. <laughs> Likewise, a car manufacturer like Ford has a number of potential substitutes for their products. A consumer could forego owning a car and simply substitute other transportation options like biking, taking the bus, or using a rideshare company like Lyft. The fifth and final test is competitive superiority. Now, this is a tricky concept that is somewhat comparable to Michael Porter's ideas on differentiation. And yet, managers seem to have trouble identifying the resources that actually make them unique. When companies examine their core competencies, they often engage in a feel-good exercise where they ignore quantitative and analytical data in favor of feelings and gut reactions. Managers are rarely able to assess their own capabilities in direct comparison to their competitors' capabilities. Managers must ask and rigorously analyze if their firms have distinctive competencies and true product differentiations. We can use a competitive pairing that we've already examined in this video series, Five Guys versus Shake Shack, to further examine this idea. Each firm has distinctive competencies that confer limited competitive superiority. Most people tend to prefer Five Guys fries, their burgers are larger, and they have unlimited burger toppings. On the other hand, Shake Shack has a better dine-in atmosphere with hip, locally inspired design, a socially responsible orientation, and of course, better shakes. So each firm is able to succeed in its particular niche. After doing the five RBV tests, it's also critical to consider how to invest in order to maintain and grow your resources. We know that resources lose value, rareness, and inimitability over time. Chrysler is a great example of this. In 1990, Chrysler was the third largest car company in the world. Their cars offered luxury type stylings at a modest price. Fast forward 19 years. Chrysler has failed to invest in their capabilities to create affordable luxury, and with the PT Cruiser, they've unleashed Frankenstein's monster on the world. Whoa! After they nearly failed and were acquired by Fiat, the combined size of Fiat and Chrysler is only the eighth largest car company in the world. To expand resources, Collis and Montgomery argue that firms should expand current resources into different industry contexts. For example, Uber has a core resource in logistics that connect broad pools of drivers to broad pools of riders. They've moved from their original product, Black Cars On Demand, to matching riders with drivers and other riders in order to create Uber Pool. More recently, they've expanded their logistics capability to match truck drivers with freight loads in Uber Freight, and of course food delivery for all of us who prefer our food eaten in sweatpants and with the side order of Game of Thrones. That's all for now. Please like and comment below, especially if you have suggestions for other foundational business strategy topics that you'd like to see summarized. Thanks for watching.